I'm excited to have with me today as my guest, Nicole Shallow. She is a sleep expert and specialist, and she's here today to talk about her specialty with sleep and the importance of getting a good night's sleep. And how do we do that? Well, Nicole is here to tell us her expertise. Welcome, Nicole. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so nice Nicole, I'm, I'm really excited because I think we can never get enough sleep. Is that right? I mean, we can always get too much sleep, but like <laughs> there's a balance of how can we get the right amount of sleep that works for us? Yes. So can you tell our viewers and listeners how you became or your interest in getting, you know, becoming a sleep specialist expert? Yeah, well, it's like a flashball memory where I was in class during my master's and one of my favorite professors, she was telling us about how there's behavior analysts who specialize in toileting, who specialize in feeding, and some of these main foundational pieces that really support you know, high quality of life. But there was no one really doing sleep here in British Columbia. And I took that as a challenge. And I know from my own personal experience, I always struggled with sleep. And I didn't realize that it was actually more behavioral in nature versus physiological. And it was just something I had to live with. And it wasn't, and when I figured out that it was a skill that you can learn and you can figure out how to set your own body up for success for sleep, I was like, I can do that with environmental changes, data driven decisions. I was like, let's do it. And I started working with clients pretty much right after that, after receiving some mentorship. Parents of neurodivergent children, are you struggling with sleep? Well, I'm here to help you. And today we're going to talk about three tips that you can implement today to improve sleep tonight. Number one, keep wake time consistent. This is really important to make sure that they're tired enough when they go to bed. Number two, schedule in quality parent connection time before bed. This will reduce the motivation to ask a million questions when it actually is time to go to bed and it may help with fading parents out of the bedroom if needed. Number three, create a consistent bedtime routine that works for you and your family. Embed lots of choices, maybe use a visual schedule to help with predictability as you're starting to create a healthy bedtime routine. If you have any questions about sleep, if you wanna know why your child is struggling with sleep, my DMs are always open, so please feel free to reach out and I'm happy to connect. Oh, wow. yeah. yeah. I mean, yours, I mean, your background is so impressive. You know, you are a um, certified behavior analyst or BCBA yes. and, you, and your behavioral gal consulting incorporated. I mean, I mean, I'm looking and I'm thinking there should be more of you. <laughs> I know, that's what I think too. That's why I'm creating more and we'll totally talk about that later. <laughs> yeah. So I just like, you're especially so needed. And so when, like, what does that look like? Um, you know, there are myths there, like, okay, getting a nap, you know, I used to think, well, for myself, like, oh, I feel kind of lazy if I take a nap. Um, but it isn't really, right? It's, it's, it's good for you. Yeah, so naps are, there's so many myths when it comes to sleep. And if you Google it, you can get really lost in the tunnel of everyone's opinions. And of course, today, this is my perspective from a behavioral standpoint. Um, but with naps, when we're looking at naps, it's asking ourselves, why are we taking the nap? What's the purpose of the nap? So sometimes like as students who are studying, I use this frequently once I learned about this, is using sleep to help you with learning mm -hmm. and memorization. So if you have a like study session and you need a quick nap, you can use that to really help you learn like and integrate what you just learned. Mm -hmm. um, naps, if you are highly active, you may need naps in the afternoon as a recovery. So I was a swimmer and I slept well at night when we had like long swim meets and things like that. Um, but I would always nap between races because it allows your body to integrate the muscle memory of your first race, but also how to move and recover and then also perform better later on. 
So Ooh. using naps strategically. Um, I'm also pregnant right now. So naps are definitely a thing. Like I am, I've been struggling with the sleep piece for the last five months. Um, the irony is very much um, ingrained when I wake up. I'm finally this last week, I did get better sleep, but I ha- learned some tips and tricks, which is just stay the course um, mm. and monitor the naps, limiting them. If you have too min- too long of a nap and it's impacting your ability to fall asleep at night, then you may want to look at cutting the nap or mm. how can you shorten it? So using them really strategically and just noticing why am I napping? Is it because I'm not sleeping well at night? Then maybe it's looking at nighttime. Yes. I mean, it's, I mean, that's where you come in, right? Where you help um, people uh, to get a good night's sleep. And how do you do that? Because um, the behaviors you have, like, for example, if you drink caffeine before going, you know, before you sleep, you can't sleep because you had caffeine. Mm -hmm. Um, It could be the sugar. uh, It could be uh, just stress, right? Obviously we're everyone, you know, stress is there but these are the things that you work with your clients and how to how to you know change that so can you tell us about what you do exactly yeah so when a client comes through and a lot of the clients i do see are neurodivergent children and families Um, i find the parents learn a lot when i'm teaching their kids how to sleep they learn and change their own sleep patterns Um, but sleep is physiologically similar across everybody, but there's different variables that may be slightly, you know, against them, depending on if the diagnosis involved and um, their life experiences and what they have to do during their days and things like that. But Mm -hmm. at the end of the day, sleep is sleep. And how do we adjust the environment in order to support that? So when you mentioned things like caffeine, caffeine is a wonderful like wonderful thing that we will use. And again, it's using it to your advantage. Um, Just the one thing to note about caffeine is that it does have a half-life of about five to six hours. Mm. So it takes a while for the caffeine to exit your system and you want it to be as low as possible before you go to sleep. It can interfere with the ability to fall asleep. So I'm sure if anyone listening has ever been accidentally dosed with the caffeinated coffee for after dinner versus the decaf, they know that feeling of my body's physically tired, but my brain is going wild. And that's that caffeine taking over. Um, I know it happened to my mom the other day and she was up until 5 a.m. because they gave her the wrong coffee after Um, dinner. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, so so to get back on track then, if you missed, um, you know, a good night's sleep, like how long does it take to get, you know, as I said, back on track with, uh, you know, getting enough sleep? You just have to stay the course. So one night of, you know, not great sleep. It's all about that self-compassion piece and knowing that this is an, one night. Every night is going to be different. Um, Some people, it can cause further stress, and that's where insomnia kicks in. If it starts to become a pattern and you don't understand what's actually happening, there's almost a fear or a frustration that that surfaces when it comes to sleeping. And Mm -hmm. when I support clients, it really is, we look at their sleep story. So I get them to just tell it all, history, what does their sleep look like? Did they ever really learn to fall asleep on their own? What does, and then also looking at the medical component. So everyone has different physiological needs. And so from my, as a behavior analyst, one of my ethical codes is really to rule out medical. So I've dove deep into what could all be influencing everyone's sleep and then providing them with resources of who may be complementary in my support. So I do see myself as like, gateway to getting better sleep but then let's bring in people so if there's nutrition deficiencies we're going to need a nutritionist Mm -hmm. that's not my area of expertise if there's thought to be a hormonal reason for the sleep challenges then let's look at let's find someone who can specialize and who can support that 
if there's any airway issues, ENT, right? There's yes. snoring if there's um, any of that like sleep apnea type red flags that I may see based on a discussion. Then we bring another professional in. Sleep mm -hmm. is sometimes, sometimes it is just sleep and it's just the environment and it's just behavioral. But it's also important to note that poor sleep can also be a symptom of something else. Right. So it it's understanding and how to discern between the two. And that's where I come in. And I find clients who I see, they find it very helpful to talk to someone who can see it from both standpoints, but then also provide the resources that you need to be able to get to where you want to go, which is a better night's sleep and feeling rested during your day. Mm -hmm. And when you see your clients, like it depends on their, you know, their story or how their background. So it may take uh, maybe a couple of months or maybe it'll take uh, a few more months after that, depending on what the issue is, correct? And, and, and it's looking at the bigger picture, right? Like it's um, holistically, if, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. Um, sometimes if sleep has been, you know, challenge for a long time sometimes it can take a little bit longer to get to that end goal but it's mm -hmm. trusting the process and yes. allowing the body to recalibrate because it's been doing it it's stuck in a different habit and a different you know circadian rhythm for a while so you have to allow your environmental changes to you know, support it, not necessarily control it. And that's something around sleep. When I talk to especially adults, and even adult like parents with their children, there's mm -hmm. a, there's a feeling of I want to control this. And physio like we can't control our physiology. So how can we just set it up for success? And there's a few simple suggestions. And I've had cases that come through my door where it is, we do the assessment and we figure out, hey, it's actually doesn't have to be a big to do. Yes. Let's make this one change and see how does sleep change. And that's where my data, like I'm very much a data driven <laughs> approach because I love the numbers and you can see in families and my clients can see the changes based on what they're they're changing in their behavior throughout the day. Yes, you know, the, I was going to talk about, well, technology, right? I mean, it seems like, I know myself, I'm always with, my, my phone is with me. So that's another, that you cannot get a good night's sleep because sometimes your mind is going or, you know, you just, it's not a good thing, right, Nicole, to, uh, to be too much on your phone, like before bedtime, like, um, know two hours before bed I yeah and it depends and so what I've learned like working with the neurodivergent community and being neurodivergent myself my brain needs different things than some mm -hmm. other brains like my husband can look at at his twitter he can look at his phone right before bed and he sleeps so well yeah. it doesn't affect him in the same way that it will affect me um I have had to set some boundaries with my phone, especially during work days when I'm on screens all day. Mm -hmm. I notice my my body is not always tired, but my, my eyes are really tired, but my brain just is so used to this multitasking that it takes about two hours for it to just settle down. Mm -hmm. Whereas other brains can, you know, shut the computer and go to like have dinner and, and feel like they're relaxed when they get into bed. And so everyone really needs different things. Um, when it comes to screen use, again, I'm always a it depends person. I'm never like, no, um, because I also will find myself, you know, if I'm caught up in something and um, I'm on my phone and, and I know the consequences if I'm on my phone too late, like I'm very self-aware. I've chosen this route tonight. <laughs> it was a, a conscious choice to stay on my phone. And then I'm okay with that. I know it takes about an hour for me to settle back in and, and sleep may come a little bit later and that's okay.
No, it's great. It. It's great what you what you said. It's so, you know, helpful information. You know, because everybody is different, right? As you were said, saying earlier, and you were talking about as a swimmer, right? You were a professional swimmer. Um, Just, yeah, I did competitive swimming in the summers, but my husband he did more swimming. Um, but just being competitive in a sport, I definitely learned a lot. Yeah. So getting enough sleep can enhance performance. Mm -hmm. And also too, like, what about foods? Like, um, like sugar cravings. I think I mentioned that earlier and, and, um, you know, or, you know, that can, you know, not get you to go to sleep too much sugar. <laughs> I know. I think it's, and it's, again, it's, it's looking at sometimes what happens is sugar can, you actually get a tired feeling after eating a lot of sugar because you get the high and then the low drop. Yes. Um, however, it can cause like a spike in the middle of the night, depending on the sugar that you have. I know for me, if I like whenever I would go to you know, a Whitecaps game or Canucks game, I'd be like, yeah, I'm going to have a Coke or a Diet Coke. There's caffeine in that. Cool. Making choices. And I would have a really hard time falling asleep. Yes. <laughs> so, but you just... Uh, Sleep is all about that self-awareness piece. How does this food interact, like interfere with me? There's no one size, like one change is going to fix the sleep, but there's all these little micro changes that you can make. So adjusting your meal times. If you can have consistent meals, you may not have those same cravings. When we have cravings, and of course I've experienced a ton of those in the last few months, it's noticing why it's usually our body telling us that we need something different or we're maybe missing something in our diet. So looking at that, but not having to go intensely. Okay. I'm going to fix my nutrition because it's going to like, I'm going to sleep better right away. Just changing it and adjusting things um, can really help be helpful and supportive for your circadian rhythm. And nutrition is definitely key because you need all those micronutrients to produce the hormones that you need to initiate sleep and sustain sleep. Oh, that's wonderful. You know, Nicole, is there any, um, like, chamomile, would that help you fall asleep? <laughs> Again, everyone's so different. Sometimes it's a part of your evening routine. If you enjoy a herbal tea, I'm always... I've tried it and it will help me calm down sometimes, I guess. But then I also like have to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night because I drank tea and my body just, you know, it just needs to move it out. So finding the routines in the evening that are calming for you is really key. And so there's chamomile tea. There's all sorts of different teas. Again, when they promise sleep, just know that you're using it to calm it may not give you the results you're looking for. And there's so many pieces to that puzzle. Yes. No, that's wonderful. Um, you know, such helpful information again. And I want to know more about your specialty, you know, what you do. Like if people are watching and listening, what's the first step that you would provide? Yeah. So I always suggest a discovery call. Um, during the discovery call, that will help me kind of discern, is this medical? Is this, is maybe a mental, like more mental health professional needed if it's anxiety based um, or is it behavioral and can how, what would I envision the support to look like? Because I've realized over the years, I've been doing this for five years now, is that mm -hmm. every case is so different. And those discovery calls are so important to make sure that we're a good personality fit, um, that we both, I can get all the information I need to know. Am I a good fit for them right now? Or when would I be a good fit for them and kind of send them on their way with a little piece of homework, of maybe some other professionals to bring in. And then if it is a go, then we start with the assessment. The assessment's about an hour, 90 minutes. Oh, getting all the information that I can, as well as reviewing the data that they've collected. So I can really get an idea of what's our baseline what is sleep really looking like right now? And what do I think we will need to plan, move forward to get to achieve the client's goals? Mm -hmm. And so speaking with the client during that time, building that trust and relationship and knowing that I know how, like how much can they handle right now? Should we do small changes? Let's start there and then move towards the big end goal. 
Those behavior analysts were really good at that. We see the end goal, but we're really good at breaking it down into real micro steps. So it doesn't become too overwhelming. Changing too much too fast does not usually result result in the results that we want. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's a process. It's a process. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes. Nicole, what do you love most about what you do? Oh, I just love being able to give that gift back. The gift of feeling at ease and just knowing everyone, like my clients, knowing their bodies and knowing how to support them because sleep does go off track. It's so normal yeah. for sleep not to be perfect. There are lucky ones out there who've never struggled with it. But I would say a majority of everybody has experienced some sleep difficulties in their life. And how can we use our environment to change it? Because it's not our fault. Like it's not the client's fault. It's not, it's not my fault. Like if I'm not sleeping well, it's not my fault. I just have to keep going with the tools that I know. And they're not, it's not hard. Like I don't want it to be hard work. I want it to be you know, soft and slow and at the client's pace. Yes. I think that really yes. helps. Yes. And your profession is so needed, your specialty. So, <laughs> yeah. So tell us, um, you know, about other services you provide. I know you have, I'm understanding, a new program, Sleep Compensate Program. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So for me, I really found, I just know I can't support everyone in this entire world <laughs> to sleep better. That just is. But to do that, to be able to have larger impact, I've created a training program where I share everything that I know for other behavior analysts to be able to provide this service in a way that's compassionate and inclusive and really full of knowledge so that they can take that and build out the support systems that they can in the countries that they're in, because it's not sleep support is not really accessible mm -hmm. and to be able to do it from a behavior analyst lens, I've learned because we're so attuned to the data, we are attuned to our clients and we can understand what the pivotal skill is going to be to get the results. It's quick. It can be quick. It can be precise. And that's where I find our services are needed. So I've just, I created this eight week program. It feels like a university course. There's assignments, there's homework, there's office hours um, to make sure that they feel like they can apply it right away and bring their cases to me and we can go through it together um, so that I can replicate myself and send more of me out there into the world knowing that they're getting high quality services. Yes. And, um, you know, have you talked to your professor? You know, he said he took up the challenge. And now you're, you're I know. Alive. I should really send her an email <laughs> saying thank you again. I always, I don't know if she's heard me on these. I always talk about her on the podcast. And I always say that's where my story began because I will remember it to this day. Because um, at the time I had a cl clients that were really, really struggling. And I didn't know how to conceptualize it and how to start. It's like, where do you start in something that's so complex? But with the systems I've created, I can definitely see that now. I can yeah, see it clearly. Amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. It's it's really wonderful. We need more of you, but you know, I just but is there anything else you'd like to add, Nicole? Yeah, I thought I would leave like the audience with like just some basic like your your foundations when it comes to sleep and things that I've implemented in my daily life just to make sure that I'm setting my body up for success at night, but also like really just supporting myself throughout the day. Um, and a lot of that, so it starts with your morning and there's a lot of talk about evening routines, but mm. if you have a solid evening routine, but your whole day is just go, go, go and you're missing some of these key parts. That evening routine cannot solve all. That's what I've learned. So I'm giving everyone the hot tip for today. 
Um, starting with your boarding and really embedding gentle movement, whatever that feels right for you. Some people love to wake up and just do a HIIT workout. That is not me. I am a, like, I'm a nice walk, maybe some yoga. Um, even if it's 10 minutes a day, just to get your body moving. Um, and daylight, of course, right now, depending on what time you wake up, it is not light until later. <laughs> but <laughs> even getting outside in that cold temperature, going for a walk, um, it can really just wake our body up and tell us, okay, it's time to kickstart the engine. Let's go. Um, because if your body is having trouble waking up, things your digestive system is going to take longer to turn on. And everything is just going to be a little out of whack. So movement and light right away is a great way to support yourself. Turn the lights on in the house, in the bedroom, just to wake yourself up. That information goes through your eyeballs and it just works really well. Um, and then adding in regulation breaks. And I would always talk about this for my clients, especially kids. Yeah, we talk about quiet time for kids. We talk about those that structure in the day, how important it is for kids. It's also extremely important for adults to mm -hmm. also have that quiet time during the day to find an activity that just really takes care of you. If that's reading a book for fun, <laughs> if that's listening to a podcast, if that's what you like to do, if it's going for another walk, if it's just doing some mindfulness or meditation, again, five to 10 minutes can really help just balance that stress mm -hmm. and provide some more resilience so that you're not at the end of the day, you've been distracted all day with the do, do, do. And at the end of the day, when you actually finally sit in the silence, all the emotions, all the thoughts, everything just come flooding in. But if you can give yourself time during that day to just rest, mm -hmm. that sets you up into the evening as well. Find a routine that really works for you at night. Again, flexibility is a foundational thing that I talk about because if you're trying to do something to control sleep, that can lead into more resistance and more challenge. So finding routines and allowing that flexibility to if you stayed out late with a friend, but you can still do a quick routine when you get home um, and quitting the scroll. I highly strongly suggest quit that scroll if you can and find something that if it's reading, it's listening to something or just allowing yourself to rest in bed, that's a great way to go. Um, and if you are a scroller, just asking yourself why, what are, what is the purpose? Are we avoiding something? Are we avoiding the thoughts that come through? Um, are we avoiding talking to someone? What is it? Um, and I always talk to clients about that too. Like what's the function, what's the purpose of the scrolling or what's the purpose of anything interfering um, and with no judgment, of course. And consistent wake up time. You can do anything. Just keep your wake up time as consistent as possible. Seven mm. days a week. Yeah. That's great information. Yeah, so if you get up at seven, make sure you get the next day seven. Like, try to keep the same within half an hour or so. Absolutely. Um, if you allow yourself to, if you sleep in too much, um, then you start to see, and I've seen these data patterns over and over. You have a really like 10 hour, let's say you get a 10 hour sleep. And of course, this doesn't, if you're sick, sleep as much as you want. That's okay. But generally, if you sleep for longer, you'll start to see the hours dip and then go back up, dip, go back up. And you'll feel like, why can't I get a good night's sleep? And then all of a sudden you get this amazing sleep, but it just will continue to dip up and down. So finding some more consistency to increase the quality of the sleep. And then you may start to see that you fall asleep easier. You wake up easier. Your body is now trained to do that. And having a morning routine, is a helpful way to wake up just to give yourself that structure. Oh, and the, I forgot one more meal times. Eat the same time every day yes. <laughs> if you can. Yes, no, it's just wonderful information. And people who want to um, reach out to you, where can they go? Yeah, so you can sign up for my mailing list 
on my website at www.yourbehaviorgal.com. And you get all sorts of information. There's some there's a sleep quiz on there, um, all the contact links and everything. And of course, my social media. I'm mostly on Instagram and LinkedIn. And that will be at Your Behavior Gal. And all of that's linked through the website. So it's a great place to start. Thank you so much for being a guest today. And I would love for you to come back, Nicole. Part two. Yes, <laughs> yes. part two. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me.